Hi. Um, my son Ethan just got baptized. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, so I'm David Moon, so uh, he's a moon, right? And uh, I was so worried because um, I thought I'd be really late for the service. And I was like, okay, so at least, you know, I'm before all the parks because M is before park. And I was like, well, what if it's in Korean? And I recognize the memes are before the puke. And so uh, I'm before the parks uh, all, all the way through. And then I saw my uh, sequence, and I was like, so many Kims. <laughs> and so I was just, uh, you know, uh, nervous about getting here late. Uh, by grace, they sent me to the front, and so I ran over here, and I got to listen to the testimony. Um, but, you know, when I saw the water being poured out on him, just sprinkled on him, and he was just, you know, looking into the sky, and unaware of what was happening, uh, it just came to help me realize, you know, what happened to me um, in the Christian walk. I didn't know anything about God. Uh, there was no hope for me to intellectually fathom God's grace and before that he gave it to me. And that's the hope that I have for all of you. I know some of us can be against pedo baptism, but when we recognize the grace of God that activates before we even know anything, uh, that gives us assurance and confidence for the time that we won't have any intellectual awareness of things that are happening to us in the older stages of life. And so God takes us from crib to crib to cradle to grave. And it's his grace that sustains us. So hopefully um, that grace will give you joy and happiness today and confidence. Let's stand for God's word. The question that we want to be answering today is, why does, what does God want from me anyway? What does God want from me anyway? Uh, two verses today. I'll read the first one. We'll read the second one all together. One, two, three. Beloved, we are God's children now, <laughs> and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And then all together, sorry. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, I thank you so much for being able to see my son getting baptized. And in that context, understanding your love and your desire for us to grow more into your image by your grace and by your sustenance. And yet with our, uh, with our participation and our love for you, Father. And in that, I pray that all the people of EPC would come to un understand your grace and your love and your mercy for us. That we would cherish that and become who we are, Father. We thank you and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome EPC. For those of you who are new to this church, uh, we would like to welcome you in the name of Christ because we have no other name that we can welcome you in. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He is the flesh, um, uh, the Word in the flesh. He is our Savior and our Messiah, and He is our resurrected Lord. And so, we are continuing in our anchored sermon series, uh, anchored sermon series. Last week, we looked at 1 John 2, 28 through uh, 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, to talk about whether God is pleased with us or not. That was a huge question that a lot of us have. Does God actually love me or like me? Is he pleased with us? The answer to that question, I hope you remember, is if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in him for salvation, if you believe that he lived the life that we have to live and he died the death that we had to die and that is attributed to us by his faithfulness, by us believing in him, then God is infinitely pleased in you. Infinitely. And there's nothing you can do to change the amount of pleasure that he has in his children. Amen? So with that foundation, we're continuing the next two verses. So these two verses follow right after that. First John, uh, first John 3, 2 to 3. And so today we're going to look at the next two verses, and we're going to try to answer the question, so God loves us, and we're his children. What does he want from us for the rest of our lives? And so this applies to what we should be doing for the rest of our lives. How should we live? What does God want from me right now? When you realistically want something from someone, uh, you look at that person and you assess that person's capabilities, uh, what's possible in that person, uh, and so, uh, and you ask for something that is possible from him or her. In other words, you don't ask a dog to teach, you know, string theory, right? And you don't look at ch a child and ask him to be like a saint. Uh, he will have, you know, selfishness and all these things that has to be hammered out. But here's the thing: when we want to find out what God wants from us for the rest of our lives. We have to look at our identity, who we are, what are we, to find out what we're capable of. And so, identity determines performance. Do you get that? Let's repeat after this. Identity determines performance. 
So performance and how we act and how we live in this world comes from identity and not the other way around. So performance does not determine identity, right? Identity determines performance. So uh, John 3, 8, 9 says this in support. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So why do people sin because they are born of the devil? Why do people not sin because they are born of God? They're the seed of God. Therefore, identity determines practice and performance. So what is our identity? That's a question that we have to ask. What does God want from us? We have to look at our identity. And so once again, we start from John chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, let's look at verse 2 again. Beloved, we are God's children now. We are God's children now. Now we will be, we, we have become in faith. If you believe in Jesus Christ, right now you are God's children. Remember, we talked about God's category-breaking love for all of us, how that couldn't be defined by any category of love that we can experience. And so in God's category-breaking love, he made enemies into his sons. And if we are his sons, we are his children who are beloved forever, and that is our identity, so that we are, right? Therefore, the same words that God spoke to Jesus in Matthew 3.17 applies to us. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am what well pleased. And all of that should be falling on your ears. He should be saying to you, If you believe in Christ, you are my beloved Son, you are my beloved daughter, I am well pleased with you. So we are children of God right now. And as children of God, what, if we have that identity, what is expected of the children of God? We are meant to reflect God's perfect and good moral character to the world. Ephesians 5, 8 through 9. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as what? Children of light. And then it says in parentheses, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So what is our fruit supposed to be? What does God want from us? Everything that is good and right and true. So what does God want from us? All that is good and right and true. Perfect righteousness. Amen? I know a lot of you aren't able to answer amen because what? We look at ourselves and the reason we probably aren't crying out amen right now and rejoicing is because we know that this doesn't necessarily characterize me right now. Not everything good and proper and decent and right and true is coming from me right now. And we have a paradox. What are we going to do? So our actions prove who we are because my identity is demonstrated by what I do. But then I'm not perfectly in Christ right now. I'm not perfectly doing the things required of God's children. So what do we do with this paradox? We must read onward. It says, what we will be. So we are God's children now. But what we will be has not yet appeared. So we are God's children right now, but something about our identity has not yet been completed. Something about us has not yet come yet, right? And so we call this the already but not yet aspect of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. There is something that already happened, but it's not here yet. For example, God's victory over sin and death happened and has been won, and the head of Satan, the snake, has been crushed. But the body still wriggles in this world, and we fight, fight against the flesh. We have been married to Christ as his bride, but the marriage hasn't been consummated yet. Do you get that? So we, we, we've, we've been married to him, but the marriage hasn't been celebrated and consummated yet. Already, but not yet. And finally, in reference to today's sermon and topic, what do we do from now on? What John is saying is that we have been justified and adopted. So if anyone's thinking of adoption, you know, you have to fill out legal paperwork and the uh, agency and the uh, uh, institutions involved, they make a moral, a uh, legal decision saying, yes, you have adopted this child now. But once the child comes over, his child likeness of you becoming more like you happens gradually. So legally is taken care of. Justification happened. We are God's children, but we are also becoming more and more like him already, but not yet. For example, uh, let's go to a picture of a child. Uh, so no one would look at this child and say, you know, one day 
you're going to grow up to run 100 meters in 9.58 seconds and 200 meters in 19.19 .19 seconds. But when he grew up, next picture, that's him, Usain Bolt. And so you see him, and no one looks at the original child and say, hey, you're going to be able to perform this. But on and on, we recognize already he has that within him, that he can run this distance. And so within him, within his identity, there is a capability when nurtured well and fostered well that he can perform like this. And so the question now becomes, in our case, already we were purchased and we are already justified. But here's the question, what will trigger, what will trigger our transformation into God's children? What's going to make that happen? What are we waiting for to make this happen? Verse 3, oh, sorry, same verse. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. When he appears, we shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. And there is a beautiful, beautiful, deep truth that we have to look into this. He appears, and when he appears, that's going to trigger our full transformation into God likeness. Why is that? Because we will see him just as he is not clouded in a veil, not seen through imperfect eyes, but we will see him exactly as he is. And somehow that's going to trigger something in us to become perfectly like him. Can everyone repeat after me? Beholding him as he completes us. I repeat after me for this. Beholding leads to becoming. Amen. Uh, I heard this illustration so often that I thought it was cliche until I actually saw it happen. I heard of children, who, especially daughters, who watch their, um, their moms put on makeup. They start following that. And so they look for things that look like lipstick. In Ilya's case, she found a piece of chapstick and she started, you know, uh, just, she, I think she used half the stick in one go. <laughs> she just used half of it and it's, just, it's everywhere. Uh, scared me a lot. <laughs> and so she started following after, uh, right after she saw my wife, you know, putting on lipstick. And the same thing, you know, it's like a child beholding a parent and imitating that person. That is the imagery that's being used here. And so we see kind of unclearly right now, we don't know exactly what he's like, but as he comes closer and when we see him finally, perfectly, then we know what to imitate. We know what he's like and suddenly we become like him. Psalm 115, 4 through 8. It has uh, an opposite example. So, childlike beholding of parents makes them become like them. And here's a, here's a catch. For better or for worse. In this world, for better or for worse, observing your parents will lead you down a certain path. Uh, Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They're talking about idols here. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Lifeless, right? And then it says, those who make them, those who make idols, become like them. So do all who trust in them. What is it saying? If you behold an idol, if you, whatever you worship, whatever you look at all the time, you'll become like that. When I was in college back in Texas, uh, there was a pastor who did a testimony at our church. He came over and um, he talked about how he covered his room, uh, a very small room, with uh, gangster pictures, right? Gangster pictures all over. Uh, there was a picture of a gangster holding a gun sideways, and he would imitate that. There was a picture of a gangster smoking, and you'd you know, try to roll marijuana. And there was also a gangster standing next to an Impala in 1967, so he bought that. Uh, it was pretty expensive at that time, I think. And he said this, the more that he looked at those pictures, the more that he looked at that, he dressed like them, talked like them, and eventually he joined a gang until the Lord saved him, and he became a pastor. And what he told us was this, what you have in your rooms, what you have posted on your walls, be careful because that's going to that's gonna be who you are. And so we uh, went around in a group circle with all the college students, in, and we were talking about what was in our uh, what, what posters were on our walls. And it was my turn; <laughs> couldn't say anything because I had a poster of three dolphins with sunglasses on. So, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I was pretty weird from the start, right? And so, and, and, but that's the thing. So the uh, the the imagery works this way: whatever you keep on looking at, you become. You become what you worship, you become what you're exposed to, you become like the parents you see every day. And so, 
Is it a surprise to hear the innermost heart cry and desire of the psalmist, David, when he sings this? One thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and what all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me because what? That's the only way to be transformed deeply. To behold all the time and become. Behold and become. So David, King David says, don't teach me just your commandments. Teach me when I'm looking at your face so that I know what face your face matches with your character uh, exemplified in your laws. And he's like, don't hide your face from me. Because that's what I need to be deeply transformed from all my sins into a Christ-like person. Here's a question then, a very practical one. How do we behold God? How? Uh, it, it's beautiful to say, you know, we become what we behold. So how do you behold God? I mean, I've never seen this picture. And if I posted one up here, the PCA would kick me out for using uh, images, right? So once again, how do you behold God? Uh, words are... Let's uh, shift gear for a second. Words are a person's clearest description of his intentions and his thought and his character. Words. It's what differentiates human beings from a lot of other animals. We have complicated language and syntax and grammar that we can piece together to communicate uh, what I'm feeling, what I'm expressing, what I'm thinking, and that shows most accurately, out of all mediums, what we're experiencing and thinking. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 says this, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke words, right? Spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but what? In the last days, he has spoken to us by what? His son. His son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, who, through whom he also created the world. And so, in other words, God has spoken using his words, but now the, the most exact image of him the most exact replication and, and, um, and definition of his character is his son walking in this world. So John, John 1.1 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was a word, so word as a depiction of God's uh, character and his personality and his holiness, and the word was with God and the word was God. And so the word so well reflected who God was, it was God. He was what he spoke. And then what happened? Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the exact conveyance of the intentions and the character of God through whom? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. And we have seen his glory. We have seen him. We have beheld him. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, words being carried out in the flesh shown to us, showing the exact nature of God. That's how you behold God. Uh, my wife and I, we met... Um, after one year of kakao tok, right? So she was in Korea, I was in Canada. Every day we wouldn't care about time differences. We would katok and katok and katok. And through her words, uh, through her words, uh, uh, you know, yeah, through her words, she sent me a lot of text messages. I sent her a lot of text messages. And in those text messages, I came to find out a lot about her character. I was like, wow, she's really, really gentle, very kind. She's very detail oriented. I'm exactly the opposite. And I was reading between the lines. Oh, she also, I think she wants me to kind of lose weight as well. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and so you're, you're seeing more and more of what she's conveying. And in between the lines, you see her character. But here's the thing. Uh, she comes, and I dress in my best. Apparently, you know, it was very corny how I dressed. I had a thick muffler around my neck. And uh, yeah, anyway, so she saw me. And I saw her. And it was like, <laughs> the word became flesh. Like, I now see her for all that she is. I recognize where her gentleness comes from. Like, it's the word in the flesh. And for her, I also became the word in flesh. Maybe a lot more flesh, right? But the word in flesh. And I became to her what I was talking about. And her character, her character and her honesty and her kindness became real to me. That's what, that's what the word is saying. It says, how do you behold God? See Jesus who came who represented exactly who God is. In other words, Hebrews 1.3 says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God, Jesus, and the exact imprint of his nature. So how do you see God perfectly? See Jesus perfectly. Because he lived a historically verified, objective life in this world, and we all have records to see him. 
We have eyewitness accounts. We have extra biblical material. In other words, we behold God by seeing Jesus. And nothing describes Jesus clearer than the gospel. Do you get that? So how do you behold God to become like him? You meditate on the gospel, the good news of Christ. Why? Because in the gospel, it shows Jesus, first of all, lowering him, himself, the incarnation by wearing flesh, coming to us, born as a baby in a tiny rural area out of nowhere. Not Jerusalem, not Rome, just coming to a very rural area. And we see through him what? As he put a towel around his waist and we read the gospel stories, what do we find out about him? He is humble. And through that, we see what God is humble, character. And then we see the gospel shows Jesus as God himself, the power of God as well. And so when he commands the storms and the waves, people are saying, what category of person is this person that he would command the waves? And so we see God's power in him despite his humility and God's humility despite his power in Christ. What else does the gospel tell us? The good news tells us that Jesus died for our sins. What does that tell us? Our sins were so bad that God had to die for us to recover the image of his son. And yet, so Jesus is holy. That's what that says. We, he will not deal with sin. And so to judge sin, he himself died for us. And so that proves God's holiness, but at the same time, what? His mercy towards us. He loves us to the point that he would save us by his own death. The gospel conveys Jesus' character, which conveys God's character, which we must look upon to become like him. What does God want from us? I'll just do a mid midway summary right now. He wants us to look to the gospel, to become like Jesus until he comes back. That's what he wants from us, to be like Jesus. A lot of us think that God wants a product out of us. He wants us to evangelize enough people, and hopefully when we're up there, we'll have at least 50 people saying, hey, this guy evangelized me. And somehow that's going to lead to more glory or something. But here's the thing. Uh, when I first started ministry here, I, I said this maybe twice or three times. My mentor told me, David, it doesn't matter how you perform in your ministry. If you save no one, and yet by your 50 years of ministry, no matter, even if it doesn't look fruitful, if you look one inch or centimeter or one iota more like Jesus at the end of that ministry, it was a life well spent. It was a life well spent. And that brings a lot of peace to your hearts. What does God want from you? Don't perform. We had the leadership retreat yesterday. Don't try to perform well in your, in your ministries to try to gain God's favor because what? Identity leads to performance. Performance never leads to identity, right? So once again, what does God want from you? Become more like who you are. Become more of who you are. Child Usain Bolt becomes adult Usain Bolt. And child little Jesuses become like fully mature Jesuses. And that's beautiful. It lets you de-stress a little. Because tomorrow doesn't have to be so fast-paced anymore. You can go to work. And you say, hey, this day was well spent. No matter who yelled at me, no matter how much money I didn't make, no matter what I heard from other people and how I got hurt, it's still okay if I, what, become a little more like Jesus tomorrow. And that brings a lot of perspective into a once unclear life. All I have to do is look more like Jesus tomorrow. The list of what Jesus looks like in the gospel goes on and on. Thousands of attributes in millions of different contexts as we look upon it. And it's like a diamond rotating in the middle of sunlight. And you see thousands of different facets of what Jesus looks like. And if you come one more shade of mercy, one more flavor of kindness, one more next step of justice, then your life is well lived. And you are doing what God wants from you because of your identity. The seed is already in there. The DNA is already written out. And you can do that. God expects that of you because he made it possible and he will carry it out through the end. A lot of you are worrying about sanctification. How do I grip my teeth hard enough to become sanctified, fight the spiritual war? Yes, your participation is needed, but what is guaranteeing that, that it will be victorious? Jesus, the author of our faith. What does this do to us? What does this do to us? Verse 3 happens to us. Everyone who hopes in him, who sees him, 
that he's going to come. And we're going to see him perfectly. And when we do, we're going to suddenly become like him. Until that day comes, we have the hope of that. And in response, what do we do? Kick back and eat Doritos as we're watching Netflix? No. It's like you purify yourself in that hope. I see my Lord and Savior. I, I, I think I get a glimpse of what he's like in the gospel. I know it's going to be 1,000 times more high definition if he comes. Until then, I have hope. That's why. That's why. I'm going to do QT. To become a little more like what I will see in the future. That's why I'm going to join fellowship with people that I don't care about. Because what? That's what Jesus did for me. I'm going to become more like him. Another biblical author puts it this way. It's like, Right now, we're looking into a dim mirror, and we, we don't know what we're actually like. But when we see a clear mirror of what we're actually supposed to look like in Christ, and we look at that, you know, no one looks at a mirror, and when they see a huge black line here, they don't say, hey, I'm just going to forget about that. Once you've seen yourself, once you've seen what you should be like and what's different, you start erasing it, right? Same thing, if you see Christ clearly, and you see uh, differences that aren't compatible with what should look like Christ, if you see differences within yourself, then in the hope of becoming like him, you sanctify. Why? Not to become like the child of God, no. Not to become the child of God, but to look like who you already are. Do you get this? This is what's so beautiful. A lot of religion tells you that you have to, that you have to earn your way into becoming like Jesus. But that's the same, that's the same like saying, you know, uh, if you're a white Caucasian, in order to become Korean, you have to eat kimchi. It doesn't work. And to become the child of God, you have to do good works. No, that is not Christianity. Your identity is made for you by grace through faith. No one can control where they are born from and who they are born to. And yet, by grace, God has saved you. And now you have the identity within you already. And when it unfolds and flowers and gives fruit, it will show, yes. So we wait for him to come and the hope. And we purify ourselves. That is why we take holiness seriously at the same time. Because we wait in the hope of becoming more and more like him. Dear EPC, you are what you behold. What is a conclusion to this life? How do you live the rest of this life? If there's one verse to teach you how to live the rest of this life, what is it? I'll give you a verse. I hope you memorize this. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Let us with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked before us, this life. How? fixing our eyes upon Jesus and becoming more like him every day. Amen? Beholding him every day. What does that mean? Read the gospel every day. Experience the gospel every day. See how you're a sinner beyond grace and yet by grace you're saved. And if you see that, you have hope which makes you purify. Amen? And that's the rest of life. To keep your eyes fixed upon him and to walk and become who you are. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 18. I'm going to just read this for us and summarize. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the Old Testament laws, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is the veil taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. What is, why is that? Because they feel that relying upon the Old Covenant and trying your best to fulfill fulfill all the commandments of God, the 613 commandments, that's how, that will somehow make you more like God and God's people. It's the same as non-Korean eating kimchi to become Korean. But it says this, but, and I want you to really listen and listen to this. 2 Corinthians 3 should be 16. But when we turn to the Lord, can we go there? I think we have it on, um, on the screen as well. 2 Corinthians 3, 16, it says this, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. When one turns to and beholds the Lord, the veil is removed, and what happens? Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit is, there is freedom. Okay, there's a connection there as well. I'm saving a whole new sermon for this. And we all with unveiled face now, because we turn to the Lord instead of the commandments, instead of the actions that we have to do, we turn to the essence of the character that spit out the actions that we have to do. 
We turn to him, and beholding him, what happens? Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, to another, to another, to another. Do you get that? So we don't turn to the Old Testament to keep all the rules, to become like him, and then get accepted. We look to the character of God in the gospel and while beholding, while savoring, while cherishing, while loving and worshiping, because we become what we, be, we become what we worship, you're being changed from one glory, one degree of glory into another. That's what we call sanctification. Enjoying Christ so much it changes you. Whatever you enjoy, it will change you. If I enjoy Hagen Dots for the rest of my life, I will be changed. And if I enjoy Jesus, something will change. And that's called sanctification. You must love him first. See what he's like in the gospel and be enchanted by his love and humility and grace and power. Not just say, oh, I see his love and power and, and beauty and his goodness and his sovereignty. It's like, I love that. Give me more of that. Help me become like that. Let me emulate that. Let me put posters on my room and fill my room with scripture verses that show who Jesus is because that's what I want. That's what God wants from you. Becoming by beholding every day. EPC, may you look to Jesus' face today. What does God want you to do? Quick summary. Praising, can you come up? Quick summary. Number one, repeat after me. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. I need to hear more conviction. Trust in Christ. Amen. Receive your identity first by trusting in Christ. Receive it first instead of trying to work it out and enjoy and savor the Father's love pour out to his children because that is what will produce organic good fruit. Second, and then as God's child, repeat after me, behold what the Father is like. And what is the Father like? Jesus. Exactly like Jesus. And so, hear the gospel and respond in worship. The gospel has pro been proclaimed to you. Respond in worship. Hear, respond, hear and respond, hear and respond, and you will see Jesus more clearly. And then finally, repeat after me, then become what you behold until he comes. Amen? Be saved first. Become his child. Second, what happens? As God's child, behold his face in Jesus. Third, become like that. Forever. That's enough. That's enough. No matter what happens to your children, no matter what you do throughout your life, no matter what careers and what grades and what degrees you earn, this is enough. Becoming one centimeter more like Jesus until I die. And that's enough. Because you are his perfect child. Whatever misery that you experience here, he will wipe away there. Whatever you desire to have here but you didn't have, he will give you there because you are his child. And God, every parent knows this, you want to live with your children forever. God wants to live with his children and he will get you to Christ's likeness. Don't be worried about that, but make sure that's your goal to look like the Father that we're going to live with forever. Nothing else is important. Nothing else. Do you trust me when I say this? Nothing else is important. This has to be driven into your hearts. You have to know and know and know nothing else is important. Being like Christ is all that I need. Amen? Being like Christ is all that I need. Being like Christ is all that you need. And the rest of life is just freebies, freebies, freebies. One goal in life. One father to look like. And the rest is history. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that unlike other religions, you, kept your dis you didn't keep your distance from us. You didn't say, hey, here's what I theoretically look like or philosophically look like, and therefore metaphysically you should become like this. No, you say, here is what I am like, the person of Jesus. And you sent him to us, and you say, believe in him, trust in him, be adopted through his death, and then you will become like him because of the fruit that is in you, the seed that is now in you. Thank you for giving us 
something to behold.